Hello beautiful people of the internet. How are you doing today? My name is Jackie and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today's video is going to be the start of a new reading vlog and in today's vlog I am going to be reading three books that the library picked for me. A few months ago I posted a video with some ideas I had for themed reading vlogs and I asked all of my subscribers to go vote in a poll to decide which idea I was going to film first. This was the idea that you all voted for and I was honestly not expecting it. This was the idea that I probably like liked the least and it was the one that I think was going to be the hardest to film because like I said in that video, I did not want to personally go up to librarians and ask them for book recommendations because one, I have social anxiety, and two, obviously, I do not want to take up too much of their time or bother them. But I did end up thinking of a way that I could do this video. And so basically, I got these book recommendations from the Libby app. For those of you who don't have Libby, it is an app where you can sign in with your library card and get access to ebooks and audiobooks through your library. On the Libby homepage, they also have book recommendation lists curated by librarians. So that is where all of the books I'm going to read in this vlog came from. I will start off this vlog by telling you a little bit about what I'm going to read and what reading lists I got the recommendations from. The first recommendations list I looked into was one called Library Love and this was basically a recommendation list with books that are about books or involve libraries or librarians in some capacity. So for instance, one of the books on this list was The Woman in the Library by Sulari Gentile, but that book is already on my TBR. So I wanted to pick something that I was not already planning on reading. And what I ended up selecting was The Lions of Fifth Avenue by Fiona Davis. This is a historical fiction book and it is related to libraries because the New York Public Library plays a big role in this book. I do have The Magnolia Palace by the same author on my TBR, so I figured this would be a good pick for the video and I could figure out if her writing is for me or not. So this book mainly takes place in two timelines. The first timeline takes place in the year 1913, and the main character in this timeline is Laura. Laura has been up until this point in her life content with her role as a wife and mother, but then she meets a group of radical feminists who call themselves the Heterodoxy Club, and basically her membership with this club, talking about women's rights and issues such as suffrage, birth control, and um, other topics related to women's rights, that inspires her to start questioning her role and if the life she's living is really enough for her. Our second timeline takes place in the year 1993 and it follows Sadie, who is the granddaughter of Laura. Sadie is currently working as a librarian at the New York Public Library and she's putting on an exhibition I'm not sure if it says what the exhibition is actually about. I kind of assumed that it was about Laura because it says that Laura, her grandmother, is a famous essayist, but maybe that's not actually true. But basically in Sadie's timeline, she is trying to reckon with the legacy of her grandmother. And when books from the exhibit she's putting on start to disappear, she's looking into who is taking the books and why. So this is going to be the first book I read in this vlog. Next, I picked a book from the Cozy Up with a Mystery Recommendations list, and for that I'm going to read Maisie Dobbs by Jacqueline Winspear. This is the first in a very long-running, very successful historical mystery series following the title character who becomes a private investigator in London between the two world wars. This is a very popular series, like I said, and I personally never felt a burn desire to read it even though I love historical mysteries because like the World War II era is not personally my favorite and I do believe that as these books go on they do talk about World War II when that happens and that's just not my personal favorite historical era. I don't think I've ever read a book about World War II that I actually really liked but I figured you know why not give it a try for this vlog. 
then I need to pick a third book for the vlog. And to be completely honest, I'm still not entirely sure what I'm going to pick. I did see they recently came out with a reading recommendation list on Libby for long weekend short reads. So short books that you can read over Labor Day weekend. And I think there could be some contenders on that list. Part of me is wondering if I should read Carmilla, which is a forgotten classic that like I'm not opposed to reading. I, to be honest, I probably wouldn't have read it anytime soon if it weren't for this vlog. And I know that this book is very hyped on Tumblr because it is a short classic novella about sapphic vampires. So like, maybe just to be a little spicy, I'll, I'll read that, you know, it is nice and short. And it's something that like, I probably like I said, would not read for several years, but I'm like, hey, why not read it? So that's a contender. So that is the intro to this vlog. I am excited to read these books that the library picked out for me. And I will talk to you again when I have started my first book and have some thoughts to share about it. So um, <laughs> I hate to start a reading vlog with bad news, but I think I'm DNFing Maisie Dobbs by Jacqueline Winspear. Oh my god, I'm so sorry that this is how the vlog is starting. But yeah, I've read 33% of the book. And honestly, I'm bored. I'm not invested in anything that's going on. And there's just not enough intrigue to inspire me to keep reading. So I have a lot of other books that I need to read this month. I think I'm just going to call it quits on this one. I'm sorry. I know this book is very popular, a very successful series, but this book is just too slow for me and I'm not invested in what's happening. Basically, to give a spoiler-free summary of what's been happening in the book so far, Maisie Dobbs uh, is a former World War I nurse, I think, and she starts her own basically a private detective agency in London. She's hired by this man to investigate where his wife disappears every Tuesday and Thursday. He thinks she's having an affair, but for some reason, Maisie makes him promise that like he's not going to leave his wife at, depending on like what she finds. Like not depending on what she finds. Like she's saying, <laughs> Promise me that when I give you this information, you're not going to use it to leave your wife. And I don't understand why she would ask him that. Because in my opinion, had the wife actually been stepping out on him, he totally would have been justified in leaving her. I, I don't really understand why she asked him that. And I, if I was going to her like as this man, as a client, I would be like, um, okay, I'm just going to go hire another private detective because that's my business, not yours anyways. So then she goes investigate this woman and honestly nothing really nefarious is going on but through this investigation she finds out about this man who died in World War One, and she begins to suspect that there's more to his death than it really appears. That was really it. Um, and then we all of a sudden flash back in time to when Maisie's child being raised by her single father and she gets a job working as a servant for the Comptons, who are this noble couple. And there were several chapters talking about Maisie working for the Comptons. And at that point, I just checked out because I... I just really wasn't feeling invested in any of the characters and I don't feel like this book, <laughs> considering this is a historical mystery, I don't think it was all that mysterious. I think it's a historical mystery that's heavy on the historical and light on the mystery because I wasn't really intrigued by this case that Maisie is working on. And then for us to have this section when we're flashing back to the past, like, I'm like, so you introduce this mystery <laughs> and then are like, but first, before we progress farther with this case, let's talk about how we got here. And I was just bored. I was just bored. I didn't really care about what happened to this man, if he died in the war, if he was killed. And I didn't really connect with the backstory either. Basically, head hopping is something that is widely considered to be a writing no-no. It's when you are hopping into the heads of different characters in the same scene. So, for instance, if I'm writing a scene and let's say, like, you know, I'm the main character in the scene, you should have access to my thoughts 
But you shouldn't then suddenly jump into the thoughts of the person I'm speaking to because you need to be grounded in one perspective per scene. And if you're going to jump into somebody else's head, there needs to be a clear transition because when you're just going back and forth between different heads, it gets very confusing for the reader. I know personally when I was reading this book, it was a little jarring to me where primarily we're following Maisie, but then occasionally we'll get the private thoughts of another character character that she should not have access to. It was very jarring for me. And like, granted, like, this is a very successful book. So even though it has head hopping, clearly that hasn't impacted its success. But personally, like, this is something that I've always heard of as not a good writing technique, because it's very hard to pull off. It very often feels disorienting for readers. And that is my experience with this book, I felt like the head hopping made it hard to get immersed in what was happening. And so I didn't really like that. I'm not like trying to get on my high horse and be like, I know writing better than Jacqueline Winspear, because clearly she's very successful. So it's, it clearly hasn't harmed her success in her case. I'm just saying, personally, I did not think it was effective. I thought it was very distracting. Ultimately, I just have a lot of other stuff that I need to read this month, and this book did not succeed in holding my attention enough to inspire me to continue. I don't think it was a terrible book. It was not terribly written. It just personally wasn't my cup of tea, and it's not something that I'm interested in continuing at this point in time. Hey, if you love this series and you think I should revisit it someday, do let me know, because like I said, it's not like I really hated this or anything. I think it was just taking a little bit too long to get to the action, and that's why I'm DNFing it. I'm really sorry that this is the way we're starting off this Library Picks My Books vlog. Uh, I really wanted to love this. I really wanted it to be a great new series for me. Unfortunately, I just didn't vibe with it. And I'm gonna move on to the next book. Hopefully that one works better for me. Hello, hello. So last week I read Carmilla by J. Sheridan Lefanu, which was recommended on the long weekend short reads reading list. And I actually quite enjoyed it. So now I'm finally getting around to telling you my thoughts. And I have some thrift books packages, which I'm going to unwrap while I talk to you. I had a free book reward that I needed to use because it's going to expire. So uh, one of these I got for free, and then I bought the other two. I don't remember why. I think it was either to get free shipping or because there was a promotion going on. So that's why I have three books. Um, they kind of match my fingernails. Wow, my manicure is thrift books chic. <laughs> Jay Sheridan Lefanu, I think he was, you know, sort of a British writer of sort of like more sensationalized stories, you know, things that were just, you know, not necessarily meant to change the face of literature, but meant to be entertaining. And I told you all that this was a sapphic vampire story, which I guess is technically kind of a bit of a spoiler. But Carmilla's claim to fame is being a vampire story. So even though you're not supposed to involve, know that it involves vampires at the beginning, I feel like everyone who's heard of it kind of knows that there are vampires. First thrift books package, I got The Deception at Lime, which is one of the Mr. and Mrs. Darcy mysteries. This one is featuring the characters from Persuasion. And you're probably wondering, Jackie, why did you buy this Mr. and Mrs. Darcy murder mystery when it's the not the, it's not the next one you have to read in the series? The answer is because this was the only one that was eligible for my free book reward. So I got this for free. Um, and, you know, it was just one of the few books on my thrift books wish list that was in stock and was eligible for the reward. So that's why I got it. <laughs> that's the first one. To go back to Carmilla while I open the next one. The claim to fame for Carmilla is that it was a story about vampires actually written a decade or two before Dracula came out. So it actually brought vampires back into British literature before Dracula did, though Dracula is obviously much more famous. 
The main character in Carmilla is a young woman named Laura, who, she is um, an English woman by birth, but her and her father currently live a very remote existence at a castle in Austria with just a few servants for company. That is until one night, a mysterious young woman named Carmilla shows up at their castle and she becomes a friend of Laura, but there's more to Carmilla than there really appears. And I think you can tell where this is going. I first heard of Carmilla because there were a lot of people on Tumblr who were just fangirling over it being a gay vampire story. Honestly, all in all, I really did enjoy it. I would probably give it four stars. It's not something I would have read anytime soon had it not been for this vlog, but I'm glad that I read it. I really read the entire thing in only two sittings. It's just a little over 100 pages long, and even though it's a classic, I thought it was pretty easy to read. I wasn't confused at any point. There definitely were some sapphic vibes to it. Obviously, it was just implicit, <laughs> Because I don't think a lot of people in Victorian times were writing about queer relationships. It was uh, not something that was considered very socially acceptable at that point. But there definitely was a bit of a sapphic vibe going on. And obviously, like, I could tell where the story was going. But it was still pretty entertaining. And I quite liked it. I thought it was well written. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was a fast read. My biggest complaint would probably be I felt like the ending's a bit rushed. But you know, there are pros and cons to writing such a short novella. The pro is it's only 100 pages. That doesn't take that long to read. The con is, you know, maybe if it had been a little longer, things would have been wrapped up better. All in all, though, I thought it was really solid, and I would recommend it for people who want to read a short classic and or like gay vampires. <laughs> so the other things that I got from thrift books, I got Murder is Easy by Agatha Christie. This is one of the Agatha Christie books that my library doesn't have. And as you know, if you're subscribed to me, I am on a mission to read every single Agatha Christie mystery. So now I have a copy of this one to read in the future. And I also got The Floating Admiral. Now you see Agatha Christie's name is on this one, but Agatha Christie did not write this book herself. So this is a really interesting concept. This book was actually written by, I think, 10 different authors, 12. It was Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers, and 10 other crime writers. These writers were all members of a group called the Detection Club, which was a group of British crime writers where they would, you know, meet up to talk about writing and workshop ideas together. So they wrote this book as a round robin, where basically one person wrote chapter one, and then they passed it off to another person who wrote chapter two, etc, etc. So it's a collaborative mystery written by some of the greatest crime writers from the golden age of detective fiction. I'm excited to give it a try. I think I have heard that the book is a bit, um, I'll say mishmash. I think there's a better word for it. It is, you know, you can kind of tell that 12 different people wrote it, but the idea of just this round robin from these detective writers is really interesting to me. So I had to get a copy. It also might be relevant to something else that I'm working on. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Anyways, <laughs> so this vlog did not start off the best with me DNFing Maisie Dobbs, but I did enjoy Carmilla, and now I'm going to read The Lions of Fifth Avenue by Fiona Davis to finish this vlog off. I will start the book, and then I will talk to you once I have some thoughts to share. I'll see you then. I think for this book I'm going to use the new bookmark that I got at Books A Million. A well-read woman is a dangerous creature. I mean, this book is about women and libraries, so <laughs> I think it works. Also, the color kind of matches the author's name on the cover. 
So I'm on page 280, the lines of Fifth Avenue. And I hate Laura. <laughs> the one main character, I hate her. I think she's so selfish and I can't stand her. I really can't. And now like the last several pages I've read her husband is acting in a way that I feel like is very out of character for how he's been characterized in the book so far. And I feel like the author is just villainizing him to make Laura seem better. I obviously, uh, maybe later I'll do spoilers and explain why I hate her so much, but I just think she's a selfish person. And I know this is pitched as a feminist book, but I don't think she's a feminist. I think she's selfish. You know, when you marry someone and have children, you do have certain responsibilities towards those people. To your children especially. Yeah, I'll probably talk spoilers when I finish this book, but I hate one of the main characters. I can't stand her. The other one's just boring. Yeah. So I have finished reading The Lions of Fifth Avenue by Fiona Davis, and I'm sorry to say that I ended up giving this two stars. Now, I did not think this book was badly written. The reason I rated this so low is I hated one of the main characters, and it was not like a situation where she was meant to be unlikable. She was meant to be a main character that you root for. And I hated her guts. Um, I thought she was a very selfish person. And like, don't get me wrong, I don't think Fiona Davis intended for you to read this book and think she did everything right. But she was still meant to be the main character, the heroine. And I didn't think she was a heroine. I thought she was a selfish person who was a bad mother. And I will go into a spoiler section talking about the specific things she did that made me feel that way. As for the other main character, Sadie, who's in the 1993 timeline, she was fine. Like, I didn't dislike her, but I also didn't really like her, so I wasn't super engaged in that section. Laura, I actively disliked. Like, I felt very strong negative emotions towards her. I would consider reading another book by this author. I do have The Magnolia Palace on my TBR, like I said earlier, because I don't think she's bad at writing. I just didn't like this book because I felt like the character was not sympathetic at all. And it wasn't a situation where she was meant to be unlikable, which is what my problem was. Like if you're writing a character intending for them to be unlikable, I'm cool with that. The problem is when the author's intentions and my experience don't match up, you know? So I will briefly spoil the 1913 section of this book. Yeah, it's 1913. And explain why I hated Laura. So Laura, she is married to Jack, who is a, he works at the New York Public Library and is also currently writing a book. He spent two years on this manuscript trying to make it as an author. And they have two children, a son named Harry and a daughter named Pearl. Laura ends up attending Columbia Journalism School with hopes of becoming a journalist. And at the beginning of the book, her husband Jack is very supportive of this, which I like to see because I think a lot of times when you read historical fiction, the men are very patriarchal and unsupportive of women's ambitions, which, yeah, a lot of men in the past were like that, but it was nice to see like an actual supportive partner. So Laura ends up going to Columbia and she also discovers this group of radical feminists called the Heterodoxy Club. One of the women in this club is a female doctor named Amelia, and we also find out that Amelia is a lesbian. One, <laughs> the Heterodoxy Club tells her, do not write about us. This is private. We don't want what we talk about to be public knowledge. And Laura decides to write her thesis about them anyway when they explicitly told her not to. I guess she thinks the rules don't apply to her. And of course, they end up finding out about this and kicking her out of the club. Who would have thought that if you do something people explicitly tell you not to do, they would be mad? Wow, shocking. The consequences of her own actions. 
Unfortunately, Jack does not remain this supportive husband he is at the beginning, and the author ends up villainizing him in the end to make Laura look better, which I did not like because it didn't feel like a realistic character arc. Like, he's so supportive of her in the beginning, and then in the end, he, like, actually physically grabs her, which to me just felt so jarring, and, like, the author was just villainizing him to give Laura her happy ending, Laura also throughout the book has a lot of animosity towards Jack because she feels like he is prioritizing his writing over their family, but Laura is also prioritizing her writing over their family. At one point, she finds out that her son has not gone to school in two months and has started um, affiliating himself with this... <laughs> street gang of children which was also a very weird plot point it felt dickensian in a weird way i didn't really care for that so how can you be so mad at jack for neglecting the children when you also are neglecting your children and did not realize that your son has not been going to school in two months like the hypocrisy there you know like if she was still an involved mother, I would totally understand her feelings. But she was doing the same thing Jack was doing, so it felt hypocritical to me. And then she starts cheating on her husband with Amelia. The two of them are having a full-fledged affair, saying they love each other and everything. And I personally hate cheaters. So her having an affair just completely, like, makes her unlikable to me because I cannot stand infidelity. I feel like maybe I could buy into it if this is like, if this was say like a medieval historical fiction and she was forced into an mar a marriage with an abusive man, then I think I could sympathize with someone who's cheating. But under this circumstances, I just don't think that was acceptable. At one point, Amelia asks her to move to London with her. And Laura starts indulging in fantasies about moving with Amelia to London, taking the children. And, oh, Jack will find somebody else who can give him what he wants. And I was like, sis, you think you can take his children to another continent and he'll just be okay with it? Like, that's not fair. He, they are also his children, just like they're your children. She also, on two occasions, refers to Amelia as the person she loves most in the world, which personally rubbed me the wrong way. I think other people have their own opinions about this. And I will preface this by saying I am not married and I am not a mother. I don't know if I ever will reproduce. Um, it's not something that I'm really sure about. But personally, I feel like if you have children, your children should be the people in the world that you love the most, not your lover. <laughs> you know, like... If my mother started dating someone and said to me, they're the person I love the most in the world, I would be offended. Because I think when you bring children into the world, you do have to stop being selfish to a certain extent and put them first because they are only in this world because of you. They should be the people that you love more than anyone else in the world. And obviously you still need to love yourself because it is your life. But I just felt like her saying that she loves this woman she just met a few months ago the most in the world that rubbed me the wrong way because I felt like she was prioritizing her affair over her children and I don't think that's fair because these children didn't ask to be born you brought them into the world and you have a responsibility towards them as their parent and I think this goes for both mothers and fathers like when you decide to parent you should love your children the most because they only exist in this world because of your choices and you have a responsibility to take care of them and make sure they're loved. Basically then in the end, due to a whole complicated bunch of reasons, Jack ends up committing suicide and Harry, the son, runs away. We then flash forward to four years later where Laura is still living in New York with Amelia and her daughter Pearl. And it also refers to Pearl as being Laura's helpmeet which is so unfair to Pearl because it is not this child's responsibility to shoulder emotional and like household burdens for her mother. She is a child. She is not Laura's emotional crutch. And it says that Laura has spent these last four years in New York City hoping to get Harry back, but there are no examples of what she's done to attempt to locate Harry. And it turns out that he is with this gang of children that Laura knew he was affiliated with. So my question is, really, in the last four years, she never thought to look into 
This gang that she knew he was associated with makes no damn sense. She ends up finding Harry four years later. He tells her he doesn't want to come back. And so then she moves to London without him. She abandons her son and leaves him on his own. And that to me is so shitty. We also then find out that at some point her and Pearl also became estranged. I don't think it ever said why. But this woman abandoned both of her children for an affair. And that's why I hate her guts. Because she's a cheater. She's selfish. And she's a bad mother. Like, the book tells us that she loves her children. But I don't believe she really does. Because the way she treats them is so unfair. And I hate Laura. I don't think she's a feminist icon. I think she's a selfish person. And I hate her guts. I'm not happy for her and Amelia. They cheated. They abandoned her children. So, um, two stars. I, I freaking hate Laura. I hate her. I hate her so much. So that is my rant on why Laura Lyons is possibly my least favorite fictional character this year. Like I said, I don't think... Fiona Davis is bad at writing, so I might give her another chance, but I just could not stand this main character. And I don't understand how anyone sympathized with her because I think she's just horrible. Horrible. Anyways, rant over. So those are my thoughts on The Lions of Fifth Avenue. And that's the end of this Library Picks My Books vlog. I know it was not as successful as maybe we hoped. I had a DNF a four star and a two star. But I hope you had fun with this video anyway. Um, I'm definitely glad that I read Carmilla. I did quite enjoy that one. The other two didn't really work for me, but you win some, you lose some. If you have read any of the books that I read in this vlog, do let me know in the comment section what you thought of them. I would really like to hear your opinions. If you're still here watching this video and you don't know what to comment, why don't you leave a book stack emoji in the comment section down below? Please give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more from me. I post new videos every Wednesday and Sunday. My social media links are in the description if you want to follow me on Tumblr, Instagram, or be my friend on Goodreads. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a dazzling rest of your day. Bye and I'll see you next time.